Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Epic History TV time. Suez Crisis, part one of two. I love this channel. I often talk about it when reacting to even things that aren't on the channel and how much I think this channel is just great. It has the sound, the narration, the visuals. It's my favorite channel, all right? And I'm glad to be back. Suez Crisis, part one. Let's go. If you're new to the channel, my name is Connor. I need to put on the air conditioning fan because it's dead quiet and I just, I don't like it. Okay. I think the first time I had to put on sweatpants is getting cold in New England. My name's Connor. I like to learn about history through YouTube recommendations. The original link to the video, top of the description below, right below that. Link to the Discord. Click on it. It'll send you right over there. I'd love to have you. And right below that link will be the link to my second channel, Mr. McJibman, where I do my non-history related reactions. Hit all the buttons on both channels. Love to have you. Let's do it. Let me fix this a bit. Okay. Now, I'm not exactly sure if this has to do with the Arab-Israeli wars, one of them. I, that's my guess, but I'm not sure. Time to learn. If you are not ready to learn, there's the door. You're in the wrong class. It's all right. Home is down the hall or whatever. Make me grilled cheese with bacon. I'm not a, Some people like to put tomato on grilled cheese. I, I just like it. You know, catch up on the side, tip it. All right, let's go. In 1956, a dispute over the Suez Canal in Egypt led to international crisis and war. Two fading colonial powers, Britain and France, expected an easy victory over Egypt but were forced into a humiliating withdrawal as the world's new superpowers flexed their muscles. It was a stark sign that the age of European imperialism was over and that a new international order had taken its place. Little remembered today, the events of 1956 had huge consequences for Britain and France, the Arab world, Israel, and the United States of America. This is the story of the Suez Crisis, whose fallout shaped world affairs for decades to come. If you guys want to see my reactions to Epic History TV's Alexander the Great series, World War I series, Napoleonic series, I have those playlists. You can go check out my reactions to it. Or if you haven't seen them, I highly recommend just going and watching them from uh, straight from Epic History TV. All right, sorry. Let's go. Part one, Suez Crisis, a ditch through the desert. In 1869, world navigation was transformed by the opening of the Suez Canal. This 100-mile man-made waterway through the Egyptian desert cut 5,000 miles off the voyage from Europe to Asia, as ships no longer had to sail around Africa. Its construction, overseen by French diplomat Ferdinand de Lesseps, had taken 10 years and cost the lives of many thousands of Egyptian laborers. The Suez Canal Company which owned and ran the canal, was a private company owned by its shareholders, including French, Austrian and Russian investors, as well as the ruler or Khedive of Egypt, Ismail Pasha. In 1875, to pay off his mountainous debts, the Khedive sold his 44% share in the canal company to the British government. As the world's greatest imperial and naval power, Britain had initially opposed the canal, seeing it as a potential threat. 
but soon proved to be its greatest beneficiary. 80% of the ships that used the canal were British. Maybe you guys know, I just wonder why they would have thought it would be a threat. 80% of the ships that used the canal were British, and it became a vital link to the British Empire's eastern colonies. And the jewel in the crown, India. Control of the canal and the security of Egypt became a vital British strategic concern. In 1882, when Egyptian anger at European interference in their country exploded into a nationalist revolt, led by Colonel Ahmad Urabi, the British sent a military force to intervene. The Egyptian army was swept aside, and Egypt effectively became a British protectorate for the next 60 years. British control of the Suez Canal was a major strategic advantage in both world wars. But in the wake of victory in World War II, the British Empire was in retreat. India, Pakistan and Burma gained their independence. There were revolts against British rule in Malaya, Kenya and Cyprus. Egypt had received formal independence in 1922, but Britain continued to station troops there and govern much of the country's affairs. Only in 1947 did British troops withdraw to the so-called Canal Zone, under an earlier deal with Egypt's King Farouk, that the British could keep bases there until 1956. But Egyptians were turning against Farouk. They blamed him for failing to prevent the creation of the Jewish State of Israel, and for Egypt's defeat in the Arab-Israeli War that had followed. They also blamed King Farouk for allowing British troops to remain in Egypt. In the Canal Zone, British soldiers and civilians came under attack from the increasingly hostile local population, with riots, arson and gun battles, leading the British to impose martial law. By 1952, a group of nationalist Egyptian army officers, known as the Free Officers Movement, had had enough. They seized power in a military coup, King Farouk was forced to abdicate and went to live out a luxurious exile in Italy. The following year, Egypt was declared a republic. Colonel Gamal Abdel Nasser emerged as the new leader and president of Egypt. That's a familiar name. A committed and charismatic Arab nationalist determined to free Egypt from foreign influence. In the 1950s, America and the West were engaged in a standoff with the Soviet Union, known as the Cold War. A so-called Iron Curtain divided Europe between Communist East and Capitalist West. Around the world, each side tried to win friends and limit the other's influence. Egypt, the largest and most powerful Arab state, would be a valuable prize for either side. But which way would President Nasser turn? US President Dwight D. Eisenhower wanted to win over Nasser, but couldn't grant his request for a major arms deal they'd most likely be used against Israel, which had many supporters in the US. The US and Britain instead offered to fund construction of the Aswan Dam, the centerpiece of Nasser's plan to modernize the Egyptian economy. Britain also agreed to remove its troops from the Suez Canal zone by June 1956. But then, 
border tension between Israel and her neighbours boiled over as the Israeli army attacked Egyptian-controlled Gaza, killing 38 Egyptian soldiers. I just want to pause quickly. I thought this might have been just a purely sort of Israel and Egyptian fight, maybe Israel and the Arab world around uh, the Sinai Peninsula fight, but obviously there was some factors with uh, the United States and the French and British separated from Israel, so that's something I learned so far. Act Egyptian-controlled Gaza, killing 38 Egyptian soldiers. The Gaza raid made Nasser determined to rapidly strengthen and modernize Egypt's army. Since the US wouldn't help, Nasser turned to the Soviet bloc and signed a major deal to purchase modern tanks and aircraft from communist Czechoslovakia. The deal was seen as a huge triumph across the Arab world. Nasser further antagonized America by establishing diplomatic relations with communist China. For Eisenhower, chasing an alliance with Nasser was proving a major headache. And the US and British offer to fund the Aswan Dam was withdrawn. I'm sorry, it's crazy how so much is the same. Like the the West with like France and, and Britain and the US and then, you know, the more, uh, you know, the capitalist West and then the communist East with the Soviets and China. And the same sort of game is still being played. And the US and British offer to fund the Aswan Dam was withdrawn. It was a move that would prove to have serious global repercussions that neither Britain nor America ever saw coming. On the 26th of July, 1956, NASA stunned the world by announcing that with immediate effect, Egypt would nationalize the Suez Canal Company. We dug the canal with our lives, our skulls, our bones, our blood, he declared. The money is ours, and the Suez Canal belongs to us. We shall build the Aswan Dam our own way. If Britain and America would not fund the dam, Nasser intended to fund it himself with profits from the Suez Canal Company. I want to say, just from, uh, I'm kind of smiling just because... Just try. I try to put myself in certain shoes where uh, different videos are focusing on, you know, which nation or side. And if I'm an Egyptian, and I have this Western interference for so long, centuries, decades, if not centuries, and you're finally taking over this huge, probably most important canal, and then saying, you know, we're going to build the dam ourselves. I mean, that would make me love this guy too, and. Uh, give you a lot of sense of pride. His speech received an ecstatic response from the people of Egypt. Nasser's move was entirely legal. The company's shareholders would be bought out at fair prices. Yet his decision would trigger an international crisis, war, and a new era in the balance of world power. In Britain, Prime Minister Sir Anthony Eden responded with fury to what he saw as a major attack on British national interests. 15,000 ships a year came through the Suez Canal. And from the Middle East, they brought a vital resource that the British economy couldn't survive without. Through it travels today about half the oil without which the industry of this country, of Western Europe, of Scandinavia, and of many other countries too, couldn't keep going. This is a matter of life and death to us all. Look, I'm American, obviously. I love my country with its many flaws and, and what I consider great things about it, but 
I like when I'm learning about history to take myself out, out of that. Sometimes it forces itself in, but to take myself out of that. And, and when you do, you definitely want to side with the Egyptians over here saying, you know, you know it's again, I'm not the most learned about this. Correct me if I'm wrong, or if you disagree with stuff, but this is their national in interest too, which Egypt's and Egypt hasn't been interfering with British or American affairs, like vice versa. And so looking as sort of like an alien from, and then coming to earth and trying to leave biases aside, I think you sort of tend to root or at least at for the Egyptians and, and side with their rationality more. So again, I can be swayed. So just trying to put myself in their shoes to us all. NASA, as Eden put it, had his thumb on our windpipe. As Britain's foreign secretary in the 1930s and World War II, Eden had made his reputation by opposing appeasement, the policy of trying to maintain peace by giving in to the demands of dictators. But now, with poor health and frayed nerves clouding his judgment, he convinced himself that Nasser was another Hitler or Mussolini, an Arab dictator that Britain had to face down. The Egyptian president, he decided, would have to go. French Prime Minister Guy Mollet agreed with Eaton's assessment. He had an additional reason to want Nasser gone, France was fighting a bitter war in its African colony of Algeria against nationalist rebels, trained and supplied by NASA. Britain and France now secretly began planning a military operation to seize control of the Suez Canal, remove NASA from power, and reaffirm their status as major global powers. That summer, under pressure from the Americans, Eden agreed to host an international conference in a last effort to find a peaceful solution to the crisis. Lancaster House, London, naturally attracted quite a crowd on the opening day of the Suez Conference. 22 nations were represented. Only two countries, Egypt and Greece, had declined the invitation to the fateful meeting. 18 of the 22 Greece. nations supported Britain and France's position that the Suez Canal be returned to international ownership. A proposal turned down flat by President Nasser. US Secretary of State John Foster Dulles told the British that nevertheless, America would not support an attack on Egypt. Dulles strongly believed that military action against NASA would push the entire Arab world into the arms of the Soviets. Besides, President Eisenhower was running for re-election and would not welcome the distraction. It was a warning that Eden fatefully ignored. Britain and France had already chosen the path to war. Join the ranks of our brilliant Patreon support. Awesome. This is a great channel. My favorite channel. Awesome start. Excited for number two, which I will maybe do today, but most likely tomorrow. And it seems like decisions on the global scale are never really made, no matter what country, at what time in history, who's ever tends to be the stronger powers. You know, his, uh, decisions are never really made out of what seems fair to everyone or not. And so I'm not just dogging the US, Britain and France. I, when it seems like every time a country comes to world power and, and um, a dominant force on the, on the world stage, what's right and wrong never really makes the decision. You know, it's, it's more what's in line of national interest. So and on, on one at the same time, I'm feeling that this always happens with major powers. They try to justify always a new Hitler or whatever. 
and because of course they're going to be hurt but would they really care if another country on the other side of the world was hurt when when they saw it as unjust of course not and so uh, the other side of me is also definitely on the more egyptian arab side in terms of well okay your economic prosperity can't just trample over our sovereignty so i i love these kind of scenarios here these moments in history i've been doing a lot of ancient history stuff so it's nice to do a little bit of not only get back to epic history tv but do a little more modern history so i'm excited for the next one let me know if you disagree with stuff i said or if stuff i said you think is flat uh flat out wrong wouldn't be the first time for me hope you guys are doing well see you next time